Thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. Having attended many of these talks in the past, I had no hesitation accepting this invitation to speak. I'm honoured to share the findings of recent research we've been doing at Loughborough University. The photograph you're looking at, with all its contemporary and historical design references, from letter forms to the liver bird, represents what this talk will be about, the function of graphic objects in urban environments sensitive to heritage. Over the course of this presentation, I'll be sharing insights from both practice and theory, structured roughly as follows. First, some background and the development of a graphic design perspective. Then, the relationship between graphic design and urban design. Then, a short overview of a two-year research project called Repositioning Graphic Heritage. And finally, some additional insights into applying the learning from that project to contemporary urban settings such as the High Line in New York. My professional background is in mainstream graphic design practice, and throughout the 1990s I ran my own design studio in London, specialising in literature systems and visual identity for small and larger clients in the UK and across Europe. Towards the end of that decade, I was invited to advise the architects Timpson Manley, based in Greenwich, on their typographic choices for a signage project they were doing in Greenwich as the millennium drew near. That led to various other collaborations for sign schemes in the city of Westminster, the Rope Walks area of Liverpool, and we won an international competition to design the pedestrian signage and wayfinding system for a scheme encompassing the city of Canterbury and the outlying locations of Whitstable and Hearn Bay. Unfortunately, the Canterbury scheme was not built due to lack of funds, but here you can see the main graphic elements of the design. It incorporated illustrations from Andrew Davidson, who some of you may know from his work on pub signs with the partners. I also proposed the use of three Eric Gill typefaces, Perpetua, Joanna and Gill Sands, to provide a visual link between these three very different locations, utilising Perpetua's finesse for Canterbury, Joanna's robust design for the fishing village of Whitstable, and Gill Sands for the seaside town of Herne Bay. Although aware of the historic and heritage related connotations in both the Greenwich and the Canterbury sign schemes, I couldn't have anticipated a return to these preoccupations in my research this past few years. The experience of working on these pedestrian signage and wayfinding schemes in the late 1990s provided the impetus for a move from practice into higher education in 2001 when I decided to change career path and explore the possibilities for research. I carried over questions that had arisen when undertaking photo documentation for these projects, specifically relating to the relationship between graphic form and urban context. This resulted in undertaking a part-time PhD in architecture at the School of Architecture and Built Environment at the University of Nottingham, where my supervisors were urban design academics. Having started with a broad research question what are the visual communication requirements of a built environment? My thesis ended up an exploration of graphic design as urban design and the notion of the urban graphic object. What I essentially did was bring a graphic design perspective to urban design theory and practice, starting with my professional understanding of typeface design, typographic design and graphic design within the larger scale of urban design. Building on the earlier work of well-known graphic designers, such as Herbert Spencer, I started to use graphic design as a theoretical framework, or lens, drawing from Nelson and Stoltenman's work on systemics in their book The Design Way. This directly aligned with the way Rick Poyner has referred to Spencer as casting a graphic eye on his subject, or what Guy Julia has more recently referred to as the graphic treatment of the city. The justification for using graphic design as a viewpoint and as a way to define a miscellaneous group of objects came from research into the way urban design theorists and practitioners invariably identified a multitude of graphic objects that pepper the built environment. From the very broad idea of environmental information systems or visual communication displays to lettering, flagpoles, billboard advertising, posters, 
works of art and so much more as you can see here. To further substantiate this, I look beyond graphic design in the established sense of the practice, towards the way the word graphic was used in other fields. For example, the way Mitchell draws from art history to define graphic images as pictures, architectural imagery, designs and sculpture or statues. Or the way geography refers to graphicacy as a communication competency. Even the way literary criticism defined the idea of graphicality in prose as far back as 1858 to mean the way words paint pictures in the mind. These seemed useful ways for graphic design scholarship to extend the idea of graphic design as a theoretical and intellectual activity in the pursuit of research as an extension to practice. At the same time, I maintained a close connection to graphic design and the proposition that urban public space is a stage upon which graphic design is played out in all its diversity, as stated in this quote from Ellen Lupton in her chapter on the street in her book Mixing Messages. Whilst I found such comments inspiring, I also reflected on how similar sentiments often fell short of a full understanding of the urban context, and this can be said of much of what has been written since Spencer's work in the middle of the last century. Of course, when we look at urban places, they can be extremely dense in their use of graphic form, perhaps no more than Times Square, where we see the function of graphic design at its most potent, from persuasion, information, decoration, and any other ways you might wish to categorise what it does. For example, as advertising, as spectacle, as information, as orientation, as way showing, as nourishment, as news, as infrastructure, as recruitment, as safety, and much more. I found theory a useful way to organise my thinking about this, and the notion of graphic design as urban design emerged as a clear way to frame the research. In turn, this helped me further understand the role of the main built environment professions, such as architecture, landscape architecture, city planning, and civil engineering, and I benefited from urban design scholarship in this respect. I also drew from social science and learned about the micro-macro duality to then frame things as micrographic, mesographic and macrographic. This suggested how the mesographic level offered an interesting intermediate state to think about where graphic objects are most effective. Should you want to know more, read this article published in the Journal of Urban Design. This led me to further use this perspective as an analytical tool and I expand on this in my book, Graphic Design in Urban Environments. Featured in the book is the Blackpool Comedy Carpet, which can be identified as a macrographic object in Blackpool's £56 million seafront redevelopment. At the smaller scale, the micrographic level, we can identify objects that will not generally attract the public's attention, such as an apostrophe seen here in the bottom right hand corner. It seems that the carpet is most impactful at the mesographic level or human scale at which people more fully engage with the comedic communications in a meaningful way. I'll return to this idea very soon but I hope this conveys how design facilitates the transitions between the defining properties and configurational patterns of a type, typographic, graphic and urban design continuum. In looking carefully at objects such as the Blackpool comedy carpet, I completely overlooked their value in the communication of cultural heritage. In 2018, the Arts and Humanities Research Council issued a Newton Fund call for research projects that fitted with their three thematic areas of design, creative and performing arts, and heritage. It seemed relevant to reevaluate the research I'd previously undertaken to see if it might be suitable to attract funding for future research inquiry. Thankfully, we were successful in securing funding for two years to undertake a project in collaboration with Tongji University in Shanghai as part of the development through the creative economy in China scheme. Two questions guided the research for the grant, as you can see here. 
what new perspectives can graphic design contribute to design for urban heritage? And how can participatory design approaches enhance urban graphic heritage for greater social cohesion? I'll focus on the first of these for the remainder of this talk by explaining how the various strands of practical observation and theoretical knowledge are synthesized in the service of the heritage visitor experience. At this point, it will be helpful to introduce some basic definitions to confirm heritage as valued objects and qualities such as historic buildings and cultural traditions that have been passed down from previous generations, according to the Oxford Dictionary of English. Within heritage practice and theory, two prominent phrases are heritage interpretation and heritage presentation. These seemingly come the closest to what we might identify with as designers, not least because they both show concern for graphic communication in one form or another. As noted here, heritage interpretation accounts for the full range of activities that heighten public awareness and enhance understanding, whereas heritage presentation is seemingly concerned with the communication of content. Clearly, there is some overlap between the two. A third phrase from heritage studies is heritage representation, which seemingly expands on the range of communications that may be deployed to convey heritage. This listing is derived from a literature review of papers from the International Journal of Heritage Studies, and I've categorized these under five key headings of word, image, print, screen, and environment. Its relevance is heightened when placed next to an overview of graphic design outputs, based on several notable publications by practitioners, critics and researchers. When placed side by side, it's clear from this juxtaposition where the opportunities lie, and this shows the potential to expand on the way heritage studies has attempted to embrace design in the early 21st century. It's also clear how graphic design can provide more detailed and in-depth knowledge and understanding about how heritage, interpretation, presentation and representation may advance in practice and theory. In support of this opportunity to align heritage studies with graphic design within the wider context of design for heritage, this basic model provides an introduction to graphic heritage, and I proffer this as one of the major findings from the Repositioning Graphic Heritage Project. I'll next briefly introduce this to show how graphic heritage spans heritage interpretation, presentation, and representation through some empirical evidence. In this model, graphic heritage spans the what, why, and how of heritage interpretation, presentation, and representation. I use the example of the inscription at the bottom of Trajan's column to illustrate this. As heritage interpretation, graphic heritage is concerned with the question what might be deemed graphic heritage? For example, the Trajan inscription. As heritage presentation, graphic heritage is concerned with the question why it might be considered graphic heritage. For example, the Roman alphabet's underpinning structure based on the golden section. And as heritage representation, graphic heritage is concerned with the question how does this impact on everyday life? For example, Edward Johnson's underground alphabet derived in part from his study of the Trajan inscription at the V&A Museum. Let me now start to draw this presentation to a close by fitting this into a wider communication context and take this model and apply it to the complexity of the urban environment, perhaps the ultimate urban graphic object. The city is certainly a communication object, in the way urban designers recognise communication as the fundamental function of cities and urban places. And Henri Lefebvre encourages to think about urban phenomenon as a message. Coupled with claims that heritage conservation is also a communicative act, we don't need to look far to see how graphic design as a communication act underpins the notion of urban graphic heritage. As a communication object, we seemingly expect to learn something from looking at the city, especially from great heights. 
This simple graphic element on the window of the observation deck of the Shanghai Tower orientates this spectator to seek out and fix her view on something meaningful. In straightforward terms, this device is an example of graphic heritage. The observer is looking at this complex view of the Shanghai Bund, a mile-long stretch of waterfront on the west bank of the Huanghu River. Established initially as part of the British enclave in Shanghai during the early 19th century, the Bund developed during the period of the former Shanghai International Settlement between 1863 and 1943 from the merging of British and American interests. It's an area steeped in what some refer to as colonial heritage and forms one of the case studies in the Repositioning Graphic Heritage Project. The Bund's colonial heritage status refers in large part to the waterfront buildings and their role as part of a former working harbour and commercial centre of Shanghai, when it was said to be one of China's most photographed and written about urban places with one of the world's most identifiable skylines. At the heart of Shanghai, the Bund's visual aesthetic is more European than Far East and displays the symbols of empire that nowadays also incorporate more utilitarian graphic objects such as the pedestrian crossing. Although this would not typically be identified as a heritage object, the crossing is in a heritage location and as such contributes to the way this heritage place functions. The Bund is now a visitor location displaying a multitude of sign types such as bespoke wayfinding systems that contribute not only to the local sense of place, but also to the national network of road signs, each prioritizing the Chinese language. In the Repositioning Graphic Heritage Project, the Shanghai Bund is compared with the Liverpool Maritime Mercantile City World Heritage Site. In this location, we also see many kinds of sign which provide clues to the historical and contemporary use of the space. This is connected to wider national networks of graphic communication such as road signs or visitor attraction endorsements. Such signs provide an important social function in gathering people together for decision making. We learn about other aspects of heritage through advertisements or through sculpture. And the architecture itself displays graphic elements such as stripes on a building facade or the distinctive use of colour. All of this can be defined through the what, why and how of graphic heritage. It seems the social dimension of such objects is more important than we have previously thought. Consider how we gather, ponder and contemplate in groups to learn through graphic heritage. A further insight from the Repositioning Graphic Heritage Project is the realisation that the mesographic scale is the intermediate level at which people and heritage places are integrated. I doubt much else is going on in the minds of these people as they read about heritage in one form or another. More than a fleeting glance, this engenders deep concentration. My final example is drawn from New York's High Line an urban park built on an elevated disused railway line, and an example of an earlier documented location from 2014, prior to undertaking the Repositioning Graphic Heritage Project, which at the time had not been considered of graphic heritage value. You can see here how the park sits above the very busy ground level of Manhattan. The park's visual identity by graphic designer Paula Scher is shown here in its many guises as a representative group of graphic objects that contributes to the functioning of the space through graphic heritage. But what about all these other objects too, situated and seen as part of this heritage visitor experience? Graphic Heritage provides the opportunity to incorporate these objects within an overall framework that considers this heritage place as an urban graphic heritage experience. To 
to sum up, finding urban graphic heritage has been a 20-year research journey. From along the way, I can offer two distinct perspectives that might resemble a theoretical contribution to knowledge. The most recent is to expand the concept of graphic heritage in a way that we may not have previously conceived of it. This further builds on the idea of mesographic analysis, which grew out of my PhD and has since matured to stand for the way people and place are synthesised through urban graphic objects, and in keeping with the theme of this presentation, in the service of heritage. Future directions for the research may extend earlier incursions I've made into what is known as contested heritage, but may also be called contested graphic heritage. For example, you can see here, in a political context, a manhole cover in the Italian fascist new town of Latoria, now called Latina. In a commercial context, the refusal of the Rome municipality to grant McDonald's permission to use red on their fascia signs in the late 1980s. In a colonial context, the visual influence from Portugal on these cobbled streets in Sao Paulo. Or, in a development context, this beautiful tile work in this historic fishing settlement under threat by road development in Valencia. And sports graphic heritage would be an obvious and significant area for research and practice. Who would question the importance of Pelé's famous number 10 shirt, the winning of an Olympic medal, the special moments associated with being in the right place at the right time at historical sporting occasions, or simply watching a child play Sunday morning football and the endorsements and respect for others that such everyday activities demand. All this amounts to a graphic heritage of sport. Furthermore, and as a recent extension of this work, myself and Dr. Alison Barnes have been exploring the possibilities for urban graphic heritage foodscapes, as you can see from this extensive range of food-related heritage iconography. To recap, I hope to have provided some insights from practice and theory towards the potential for what graphic heritage theory and practice could be. I've shared some background about the development of a graphic design perspective and the discipline's relationship to urban design. I've also provided a short overview of a two-year research project called Repositioning Graphic Heritage, specifically comparing the Bund in Shanghai with Liverpool Waterfront. Finally, I've made some additional insights into applying the learning from that project to contemporary urban settings such as the High Line in New York before outlining some further possible ways to explore graphic heritage in contested contexts and areas such as sport and food. Should you be interested in further discussion, contact me via this email address and please feel free to look at the various other resources we have made available at these locations on screen. Finally, we have established a graphic design research unit at Loughborough University and will welcome collaboration with Sign Design Society members for the benefit of practice, research and educational purposes. Thank you.